We are in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 13, if you want to follow along. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city hidden on a hill cannot be hidden. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the message today. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 5 of Matthew, Jesus is talking to his disciples. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it should be noted that at this time, disciples simply meant followers. In other words, they weren't Christians. Jesus Christ hadn't paid for their sins on the cross yet. He hadn't died for their sins. And so they could not be Christians, but they were followers, listening to him, hearing what he had to say, going from place to place with him. Nonetheless, he calls these disciples the salt of the earth and the light of the world. These disciples who follow Jesus around, well aware of what effect salt has, they knew of its preservative power. It's a way to keep meat. I learned some time back that's what corned beef is. The corn is the kernels of salt to preserve the meat. That's why corned beef is so salty. I learned some about that one day. But salt also enhances flavor. It makes things pop with taste. Sometimes it pops so much we tend to put too much on there and that's where we get in trouble. I had some fried chicken last night and I had my salt shaker right there with me. I love good salt on that crusty chicken skin, mm, buddy. <laughs> like it on my eggs. Yeah, I'm sure you're right there, you're laughing along with me. All of us today are aware of the benefit of salt. In fact, salt's such a big improvement, we got to watch that we don't use too much of it, don't we? Jesus used a metaphor to draw a parallel between the positive effect of salt that it had on the disciples' food and the positive effect his disciples have on the world. As the disciples heard Jesus' teaching, and as they adjusted their lifestyle according to Jesus' word, they shared those teachings with others, and that became a positive influence on their world. They had been reared under the law, under Mosaic law. It had become very rigid because the leaders of the Jewish faith had made it uh, so, so micro-detailed and that it actually became oppressive. Jesus came and he didn't dismiss the law, but he did offer a faith of a lot more liberty, of understanding, of love towards each other, of extending grace. And this was a new message to the people and they would have spread it around. And so that message became a positive impact. In a similar vein, Jesus goes on to tell them that they are the light of the world. Here in America today, and especially in the eastern United States, we suffer from light pollution. We don't have a clear view of the night skies as someone living out west or on the plains of Africa because the lights from neighboring towns and cities glow into the sky at all hours. Several years ago, my son and I took a road trip around the United States, and we were on our way back, and we were crossing central Texas. We had gotten off the interstate. We were taking a two-lane road. We were 20 or 30 miles from Hereford, Texas, is where we were coming in. Needed a pit stop, so we stopped the car. My son got out, 
pretty soon he's saying, hey, y'all got to get out and see this. So we all piled out. There was his sons, me and him, and looked up at the sky. It was pitch black, no moon, no town around. And you could see the Milky Way from one horizon to the other, just as easy to see. It was beautiful. So that darkness kind of helped in that way. But if you can imagine the darkness that the people of Jesus' day discovered when the only light was a, a flame from a fire on a torch or something, and they don't give much light when you're walking through the woods, but they could have lain there in the night in the open pasture, looked up. And that harkens back to Abraham when God told him, look up at the sky and count the stars if you can. They were certainly more numerous, many more than we can see now. But that light, they were the light of the world to light that up. The night darkness is what the disciples of the day understood. They knew the benefit of having a torch burning on the pole if they had to be out. Especially on a moonless night, the darkness could have been felt. Another trip I took, and I bet some of you have taken it, was Mammoth Cave here in Kentucky. You take that tour and you go down into the cave. You get into a room, they tell you to be still. Then they turn the lights out. That is dark. I mean, it's literally, you put your hand here, and as far as you're concerned, you don't have a hand. And it blows me away if you know the stories that there was one man lost in Mammoth Cave for some time. He would have been by himself down there when his torch went out. I don't know how he didn't fall into a crevice, but I think that would get on my nerves, having it that, that dark, that, uh, that bad. But that's what darkness is. And yet light comes in and illuminates the way. And Jesus was saying, you are the light of the world. As usual, Jesus is talking about more than just lights to light up the room. And he's talking about more about darkness than the darkness of night because the world was filled with the darkness of sin the darkness of sin in men's heart ever since Adam and Eve fell. We experience that darkness today. We hear about it too often. There is this darkness. And so these disciples in following Jesus and hearing his teaching were points of light in a world dark with sin. We are measurably better off than disciples of Jesus' day they couldn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. They couldn't have his indwelling spirit, but we do. Because Jesus has died for our sins, because the penalty of our sin has been paid for, because he has risen again, we can have the Holy Spirit abiding within each and every Christian. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God himself is within each Christian. And we are told that we are sealed by the Spirit. We are told that no one can pluck us from the hand of God. We are told that we are encapsulated. And I believe that means even we can't pluck us from the hand of God when we have truly trusted Him and made Him our Savior and Lord. So we Christians, we fully devoted followers of Jesus have the Holy Spirit, God within us, and filling us. So everywhere we go, we carry God with us. And that's an awesome thought, and it's an awful thought. It's awesome that we are taking God, even if we don't say a word, we're taking Him into these places, and the presence of God is a positive change. It's a positive impact, just his presence. So just the presence of Christians is good for our world. But then especially as we speak, as we share the word about God, it brings light to people's lives. So wherever we go, we're taking the light of Jesus Christ. That's awesome. What's the awful part? 
God is with us wherever we go. Even the places we'd rather he wasn't with us, that we know we shouldn't be, he's there. He sees us. He knows us. We can't hide anything from him. So that's kind of the awful part. But he is awesome. He is forgiving and loving. Jesus cautioned us in Matthew 5.15 to not cover our light, but let it shine in the darkness. He said how foolish it is. They would have all caught Jesus' reference to light a lamp and then cover it. That would defeat its purpose, to, to hide the light. And so Jesus is telling us through that example how we need to let our light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are the salt of the earth. We add flavor. We preserve. When we're studying the Minor Prophets on Wednesday night, and what we're seeing through the Minor Prophets is how God has sent prophets to them time and again, warning them to change, warning them if they do not change, Judgment is coming. The northern kingdom did not have a single king, northern kingdom of Israel, who was good, and they were carried off into exile ahead of the nation of Judah. Judah did have some kings that honored God, and because of that, they were preserved a little longer. That salt preserves. That salt keeps. That light brings an ability for people to see the way. When we share the good news of Jesus Christ, when we tell them that there's hope in Him, that He loves them, He'll forgive whatever they've done, He'll forget whatever they've done, He'll live with them, He'll empower them, and He will lead them on to greater things. We're giving them light to help their life. We're giving them light to find a better way for their souls, for their body, for their spirit. So Jesus teaches us, don't hide that light. Jesus also taught us that while we are citizens of the kingdom of God through salvation in Him, we are still citizens of where we live, our locality, our nation. He teaches us that we should be good citizens of the world. In Luke 20, 20 through 26, Jesus makes an example using taxes. Read along with me. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies. They were always trying to trip Jesus up, silly people. They pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, teacher, We know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. So teacher, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Caesar, of course, was a pagan, a barbarian, anti-God, the people they despised. He saw through their duplicity, however, and said to them, show me a denarius, the coin of the day. whose image and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied. So Jesus said, we'll give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. They were unable to trap him in what he said there in public and astonished by his answer, they became silent. So Jesus teaches us that we are citizens of where we are, even if we don't like that government, and that we are to be good citizens. We are to be involved citizens. In this brief account, Jesus indicated that we're to continue our compliance as citizens of our respective country, and as a compliant citizen, we are to obey the laws of the government. Throughout Scripture, God tells us that He sets kings in their possession in their position, and he expects people to obey their king. Sometimes God set a king, even a a king that did not honor him, in his place out of judgment to the people. 
to get the people's attention, to get the people turning back to him. God is always wanting his people to turn to him and they would stray away. So one of the ways he'd get their attention was give them a king that wasn't a good king. Then they would bow their knees to God, turn to him. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 13, 1, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. God expects us to be good citizens of whatever government we have. How unfortunate it is that so many of God's people fail to exercise the privilege of their citizenship, that privilege to vote that we have coming up in a couple of weeks. In the 2020 presidential election, 25 million Christians did not vote. 65 million did not vote in local elections. Local elections impact us more directly. There are commissioners, our mayors, our, our local leaders, our representatives. They're the ones close to home. We probably ought to, well, we ought to always vote for the president, but we need to make sure we vote for our local officials. But 65 million did not take time to vote in local elections. On top of that, they estimate that 15 million Christians aren't even registered to vote. Our current general election is coming upon us in a little more than two weeks. And it's even now upon us with the ability to cast an early vote or a vote by mail. The astute observer is aware that the 40 million who are not registered to vote and did not exercise their right to vote in the last election, 25 plus 15 makes 40 million that didn't participate in the last election. We are distinct individuals. We're we, uh, we understand that 40 million people aren't going to vote in lockstep with each other. We understand the diversity, the amount of understanding. So we're not saying if all Christians voted, it'd be a, it'd be a block vote because we're all different. But even though we're distinct very individuals with varying perspectives, if those 40 million practiced their citizen right, and their Christian right to talk to the Father for guidance. We can turn to Him for what we, He would have us to do. Then it can be safely reasoned that those 40 million Christians would vote according to God's plan. We have a great country. It was founded because of the desire to experience religious freedom. The settlers that founded America came out of governments where the king or some other authority would tell them what faith they had to embrace. If they were Protestant and the king was Catholic, they had to switch and start worshiping as a Catholic. If they were Catholic and a Protestant king came to power, they by law had to switch their faith. And they wanted to stop that. They wanted freedom of religion. They wanted to worship as their conscience dictated. That's what our country was founded upon. People looking for that freedom of state religion. There are some in our society that say today we should have freedom from religion, not just of religion. Meaning that we are a completely secular nation where the influence from God-fearing believers is not allowed. Freedom from religion is not why our country was founded. Our nation's Declaration of Independence says in part, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our country was founded on these principles that there is a creator, that that creator gives us certain rights, and that we deserve those rights based upon our creator. 
in our founding documents, our forefathers recognized that we have that Creator and that the free worship of that Creator should be protected. The First Amendment in the Bill of Rights says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of their grievances. That starts out in Congress shall make no law respecting, that means establishing a preferred religion. Congress cannot tell us what faith we ought to be or whether we ought to be of any faith. And they should not, they cannot forbid us from exercising our faith. That is our very first amendment. Americans were given the right in our nation's establishing documents to choose freely who to worship and to be allowed to freely worship without interference from our government. So as your pastor, I encourage and even plead with you today, take the next few days, especially if you haven't voted, study the candidates a little more, read the material, listen to trusted uh, speakers about it, Read the amendments. We've got several amendments coming up that can be, amendments can always be confusing because of the way they word them. We need to be sure we understand them. But then pray for guidance. God, what would you have me to do? God, what is it you want to have happen? Turn to him within yourself, hearing his voice, voting your conscience. That's our responsibility as a citizen in this great nation and as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. For our hymn of response today, I've asked Mark to lead us and sing in America the Beautiful. Not a typical hymn of response, but it's appropriate. It is honoring America the Beautiful, all the great parts about her, and asking for God's mercy upon this great country as we sing God shed his grace on thee. We're gonna, it's going to be with a video. Christy is going to play the piano for music. You'll see the pretty sights, but as you're singing, as you're looking at those sights, remember the focus on praying for God's mercy and grace and leadership in this great country of ours. Will you stand to sing as Mark comes? Mm-hmm.